overlap distribution with a little help from light modes, which I hope he will define. Right, thank you, Sherman. Uh, I'd like, first of all, to say that I'm very happy to be here, and I thank the organizers for giving me this nice opportunity. And the aim of the talk is to squeeze some work I've been doing in collaboration with a number of people, including experimentalists, in the last five years. And the thing we, our, the thing we wanted to do is to look whether we can measure the whole uh, distribution of the overlap parameters in a replica symmetry breaking system and a phase. Uh, what is known so far since the beginning is that we can actually access experimentally the Q Edwards Anderson, this is the self overlap by means of, of measurements of the field cool susceptibility in spin glasses, or we can also access the average uh, overlap in the zero field cool susceptibility measurements. And actually, replica symmetry breaking is one way to explain the differences between these two measurements. Yet, we cannot know the rest of the distribution. OK? And what hinders the measurements is actually that, OK, we need to access microscopic atomic spin configurations. And that is very hard to be measured for large numbers of spins in, in spin glasses. And the other thing is that, OK, this P of Q uh, between ground states is computed as the overlap between equilibrium configurations or pure states at equilibrium. So an equilibrium is hardly or never attained in experiments in spin glasses. So a first proposal to overcome this problem was uh, put forward in the late 90s by Silvio Giorgio, Marca, and Luca Belliti. And they set a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, uh, the fluctuation dissipation ratio, and that every one of you knows now, and, and the cumulative distribution of the overlap under the assumption, I mean, in, in, some, in some systems where okay, you can actually measure, where you can actually measure the full fluctuation dissipation ratio at different asymptotic values of the, of the correlator, and uh, in systems that are well represented by models in which uh, the procedure producing this equivalence uh, is, is stable, and they, they use the term stochastically stable. But I won't, I won't go into details into that, uh, because they're all here. So. <laughs> um, Yet, I mean, as far as I know, fluctuation dissipation ratio in real materials has, I mean, is harder than expected to be measured. And anyway, I'm not aware of any measurement of the P of Q made afterwards. So if any one of you have n news about it, I will be, I mean, more than eager to, to know that. So the approach I'll follow instead of uh, looking at spin glasses and try to solve the problem on, on those materials is is to move to something else, OK? Something called random lasers. And OK, I will bring you to spin glass theory. Just, just let me tell you in a very short time what they are. They are random media, so scatterers embedded in, in some, some material uh, that is optically active, where light is of a, a photons by spontaneous emission are created. And they, it took so much time to go out because of multiple scattering that they interfere with each other. And eventually, they create standing modes inside the system. And the stand, if the standing modes have some non-zero special overlap, then they compete for the energy that we can pump into the system by an external source. And there is a threshold in the, pump, in the energy pumped into the system uh, above which the atomic population is inverted. So most of the atoms will be in an excited state above an optical uh, gap. And this means at some point, stimulated emission is triggered. That is, we have a laser, OK? So there is a transition between a fluorescence and a, and a random laser regimes. And the lasers, as standard lasers, they turn out to be stable. So if you continuously pump energy into the system, the system does not explode. It regulates itself, OK, by gain saturation. And this is the uh, behavior from uh, low pumping 
too high pumping. If you can see the spot, I cannot. Uh, and you see, as you increase the pumping, the spectrum, uh, the spectra, they narrow generally, uh, generically. And in some in some compounds, you also see some, that the spikes of the modes, they, I mean, they are very irregular and very high. Okay, so a large breaking in the in the equipartition of the intensity there. And just to set the notation, I can tell you that the electromagnetic field can always be uh, expressed in an expansion in terms of the normal modes, of the modes there. And each mode comes with its own frequency that uh, gives a, a fast oscillation. And, and then there is this slow amplitude, this, uh, um, it's a complex amplitude coefficient whose time scale of evolution is much slower than the uh, fluctuations around its own end, its own frequency. Okay, now look at this, keep in mind this complex amplitude uh, A, and you put all the ingredients together, all the things I just mentioned and many others, and you put it in your cauldron. If you have no magic wand though, you can look at the literature. There are different approaches and only, or you can read the beautiful PhD thesis of Fabrizio Antenucci, and all lead to, uh, to the same outcome, okay? And the same outcome is that we have a station, I mean, uh, a theory, a statistical mechanical theory to represent the stationary regime uh, above and below the critical pumping threshold. That surprise, surprise is, uh, I mean, two plus four model where the variables are complex numbers, but because of gain saturation, because of the fact that the, I mean, the laser does not explode, uh, they satisfy a global constraint, so the sum of all the intensities is something fixed, and it's fixed and dependent from the external pumping. And with due calculations, it's not immediate, but it comes out that this can be considered as an Hamiltonian system at equilibrium at some, I call it laser temperature, whatever, at some temperature, that is proportional to the heat bath temperature because this is connected to the spontaneous emission, but is inverse proportional to the uh, pumping energy per variable, per mode. Okay, I mean, you have to trust me, of course. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a story, I know, yeah. No, they, they were quantum operators in, in the first page, but after 10 pages, there is a classical degradation to Langevin equation, and eventually we can, we can write it down in a potential way, and we have this. But it's, it's just because you mentioned, we start from James Cummings' description of, um, of the inter light matter interaction uh, with, with atomic levels, uh, with, with excited atomic levels. Okay, that's the point. But, I mean. I'm not saying this, <laughs> you, you really trust me now. <laughs> okay, and um, these couplings, the J2 and J4, they encode information about the position of the, the, the special extension of the modes inside the cavity, or whatever, the open uh, random medium, and also about the susceptibility, the nonlinear susceptibility and the linear susceptibility as well. That are things ca that cannot be computed by first principles because these systems are too, too, too complicated. The point is, look at the J4 for instance, this is non-zero if and only if the four modes, I mean, contribute, and they have a non-zero special overlap. And uh, the, I mean, their sign and their magnitude is, is uh, tuned by the value that is rather inhomogeneous of the optical susceptibility. So there can be frustration in the system. Not all random lasers will be frustrated. Not all random lasers display what, what I will tell you later. Okay, but there is one difference. I mean, it's not a fully connected system. Each mode has its own frequency, and they do interact if and only if this kind of selection rule, frequency matching condition, is satisfied, okay? So this practically induces a dilution in the number of possible couplings, a dilution unless we take a random laser whose frequencies are very next to each other. Okay, this is the first approximation I will treat now and it's called narrow band. That means that all the frequencies in their line width can be considered as 
overlapping. And that means that the uh, frequency matching condition that I was, I don't know where I'm put, <laughs> the one omega j minus omega i minus omega j minus, uh, well, there is a plus somewhere there that is wrong. It's always zero. So it's always satisfied. In this case, we end up with a fully connected, uh, I mean, standard 2 plus 4 spherical spin, only the spins are complex, OK? And out of ignorance, we take couplings uh, distributed independently mm -hmm, and with a Gaussian distribution. And just to be general, we need a non-zero average, OK? I know for us the zero average is very interesting. It's the most interesting thing. But if I want to cope with experimental results, I need to have the whole zoology at my disposal. Now, <coughs> we knew <coughs> very well how to treat this thing because we, with Andrea Grisanti, uh, <coughs> since 2004, we, we studied the 2 plus p spin uh, spherical model and many other uh, I mean, derivatives of it. And these are the relevant external parameters for this case. So there is uh, the pumping rate. This is actually, you can consider it an inverse temperature. Something we call a degree of randomness is just stupid. is the ratio between the mean square displacement of the J distribution and J0. Well, I mean, the sum of them. And then something we call the nonlinearity degree. That is, I mean, how much the J4 is the four uh, spin is important relatively with the two spin. OK, why do I call it also close, uh, cavity closeness? It is because the, the, the two term, the, term with the pairwise interaction terms, it represents leakages. OK, so it, it's proportional to the net gain. So if I, if I don't consider that, I mean, I'm, uh, phenomenologically, I'm saying that I have a random laser in a closed cavity, and I only have the four term. Well, OK. So <clears throat> these are the order parameters. OK, I have a non-zero m because I have a non-zero j0, but OK, that's not very important. I have a q alpha beta that is the Parisi overlap for the system. It comes out to be real, even if it's made out of, of complex uh, amplitudes. And another uh, order parameter that can be, I mean, during the computation, turns out to be, I mean, just uh, the out of the <clears throat> The uh, off diagonal part is equal to the Q alpha beta, and the diagonal part is actually the only thing that is new with respect to spherical, uh, to spherical uh, non complex, uh, non -clo complex uh, spins. There is some parameter RD that we call phase coherence. Uh, I don't pretend you understand it. I didn't understand it. I had to move to the XY model with four spin interactions on the Erdos-Renyi graph, where I had faces that were locking to understand what the bloody thing this was. I mean, this is a parameter that is non-zero, where you have locking of faces, though your system is still uh, fluid. Okay, so things they move as in the paramagnetic phase, but just the faces they are locked with each other. OK, this is a first um, phase diagram for the, where only the four spin is there. And you see, if, OK, this is photonic language. But I mean, this is the paramagnetic phase. And if uh, the, the disorder is weak, I, I move to a random ferromagnetic model. If the disorder is large, I move first to this uh, phase locked uh, phase. That is the only new thing. And then to a glassy phase. In this case, the glassy phase must be 1 RSB because I only have the four spin. If instead I have a mixture, OK, the transitions, they will become uh, continuous, at least in this region. But for the rest, nothing changes. Only in this region, I have more than one replica symmetry breaking. In the language, now I found out this is also the language of mathematicians, they call xi gamma. So in gamma 2 and gamma 4, this is the phase diagram. Uh, forgive me, incoherent wave means paramagnet. This is the new phase. And then you either, I mean, depends on how you want to uh, decrease your temperature. You go in this direction anyway. You can have a transition to a full RSB phase or to a one RSB phase or to even to a one full RSB phase. OK. Um, then I can introduce a new parameter, 
Okay, you, I mean, it's redundant here, but it's interesting if I want to make a connection to experimental measurements. That is this intensity fluctuation overlap. So rather than looking at the overlap between um, complex amplitudes in different states or replicas, I take, I take the intensity, so the modulus squared of the complex amplitude, and I see it's different from its average, okay, on, on, on one replica and on the other. And this is this capital Q stuff here. And I can compute this stuff. I mean, there, there was a suggestion of, of Silvio, actually. We can compute this stuff in this model. Uh, and we can see that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Parisi overlap Q to the power 2 and this intensity fluctuation overlap. And if J0 is important, I also have some contribution. But this is irrelevant for our discussion. OK. I only can do that because I have continuous spins. I might do it in the, in the classical spherical spin, but I, I know no material having that, that space. So now look at how the distribution of this intensity fluctuation overlap changes as I increase the pumping, or if you like, I decrease the temperature along this line. Okay? So at high temperature, I have a paramagnetic like phase, and what I see, I have a, a trivial delta. Soon after the transition point, continuously, I have a full RSB displayed here. If I go on and I increase and I decrease the temperature, what I have is that I have a full plus one RSB phase. And if I increase the pumping furthermore, or decrease the temperature, I end up with a one, uh, with a one RSB. Okay? This is not in the P of Q Parisi, but in this P of Q. I4. Okay. There is, a, I mean, there is a one to one correspondence anyway. Yeah. This is the result of the computation? Yes. Not the result of the experiment. No, no, experiments are dirty. Yeah. You don't see nice lines. They are dirty and also they have to be justified. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to justify all the experiments. So I mean, just if you see dirty lines, then they are experiments. No, now, point is, can I measure this stuff? Okay, so the EFO depends on intensities, and intensity they can be acquired in experiments, just spectral emission spectral measurements. They are easy to do for experimentalists. Okay, and also, if I have a solid random laser, I can illuminate it very many times. It depends on the repetition rate of the thing. So I can, I can have several different dynamical histories of, 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 um, of a random laser. Each one of these stories, I mean, the acquisition time is enormous with respect to the single photon emission mechanism. Okay, so it, it's very long dynamics, and I can repeat it very many times. Okay, um, and each time I repeat it, the, the photons, okay, they start from random initial conditions, but they see exactly the same positions for the scatterers. That is, the same, the same set of, of uh, normal modes is there with the same set of, this, of, uh, of frequencies. And so I will have the same set of the quenched random coupling, okay? Because the material is the same, the susceptibility, the optical response is the same. So, in principle, they can me be measured, of course, in real experiments, uh, in real experiments, I have no access to phases, not in random lasers. In standard mode lock lasers, yes, but here it is much more complicated, and yet it has not been ever measured. So what I can do is just to take my spectra, but the spectrum they are, I, I have intensities, not instantaneous intensities. I have, I mean, an, an average of all the emissions at a given frequency I, I had so far. I'll be back to that. I can compute over different stories, okay, I can compute the average spectrum, and then I can look at the fluctuations of each spectrum with respect to its average, okay, uh, and normalized. And then I can look at the similarity between fluctuations in, uh, okay, in two different uh, uh, random lasers, okay, two different stories of the random lasers. And I expect to see something that tells me that there is a change from one shape that will be trivial to some other thing. Exactly when I, where, by other means, I expect the pumping threshold to be there, I mean experimentally. So this is the fully connected prediction, and this is an experiment made on grains of an oligomer whose name I don't dare to pronounce, okay? So you see that there is actually a change 
uh, in the shape if you go in this direction. So a low pump, you just have a trivial Gaussian distribution of this uh, uh, fluctuation overlap, intensity fluctuation overlaps. As you increase the pumping, you see that this thing changes non-trivially. I want to tell you, if you try this on some other material like uh, a liquid random laser where you do not expect this thing to happen, you only have a Gaussian, okay? Even through the, the threshold. And okay, uh, of course this is completely qualitative. I mean, this is not the model for this material, okay? This is a generic model. But you see that you have all the possible shapes we, 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 in, we encountered in our, in our theoretical analysis. So there can be, uh, they, I mean, this is a possible measure, but to validate it, I mean, one has to go a little bit deeper into the comparison because, yes, the shape is similar, but the thing that we uh, measure, the, 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 the parameter whose distribution I'm showing is not the same because, I mean, I have for the, for the analytic stuff, I have everything under, under control, the constant energy, I'm in the thermodynamic limit, I, I have a complete graph that is not the one in reality, okay, and I, I have an ensemble, an equilibrium ensemble of, of intensities. Whereas in the, in the experiment, I, I have a finite number of modes, I do not know exactly the, the network, but I know it's not fully connected because mode locking, frequency matching is there for sure. And also I have no control on, on thermalization, okay? No control at all. So one thing to do, and so I want to know, uh, just keep the line, just, I, I don't know, I mean, I would like to, I mean, to study more this, this uh, relationship between, between these two things, apart from the fact that they are amazingly amazingly qualitatively similar. And there's no other explanation I found for it. Okay, so I can do what people like me do, um, does uh, when, do, when, when they don't know what to do, that is resort to numerical simulations. Okay, because in numerical simulation we can tune between the two, the two aspects. We can even, I mean we didn't do that yet, simulate the real experiment. Okay, with all the problems of the real experiment. But first, we want to assess the, the numerical model as a model for a random laser and as a model for a, a system with replicas imagery breaking. So I move soon to the thing. Uh, this is the model we simulate. You see there is no pairwise uh, element now. Okay, that's not a problem because, I mean, the, this is the thing that is the most complicated thing, including the frequency matching and that should display the, the replica symmetry breaking. Uh, to, to apply this uh, frequency matching condition amounts to uh, filter out an order of magnitude of, of nonlinear couplings. So if I start with n to the k couplings, I will end up with n to the k minus 1. And then I would say uh, what, what uh, Andrea Majorano was doing or what uh, Peter Young was doing, what I was doing many years ago, was to consider and simulate the most diluted uh, system you can. But now I have continuous spins. And if I start with a two diluted system, like I take, I mean, after the frequency matching, I take order n or, or quadruplets or order n squared, what happens is that one quadruplet takes all the energy, I mean all the contribution from the spherical constraint and all the others get nothing, okay? So that's what well, we, we refer to that to as intensity condensation or power condensation. I'm sure you have other names, no problem. So we are left actually with the fully connected graph with a mod locked filter. That is order n cube. That's the only option we have. So we don't have discrete spins, so we cannot resort to multi-spin coding. Uh, we cannot bipartite the thing because the number of connections for each variable is very large. So we, we cannot divide uh, the system. Uh, you cannot update on parallel groups of different spins. So the thing we had to do was to go on GPUs and thanks to CUDA master Giacomo Gradenigo and Fabrizio Antenucci, to parallelize, to parallelize the single contribution of each, of each quadruplet to the shift in the energy, okay? So we went to the core of the thing. And <clears throat> I mean, we were able to simulate up to some sides n, 
imagine that we have n to the cube anyway parameters. And this is, for instance, the specific heat. Uh, and you see that there is a peak that increases and also that, I mean, uh, goes towards, um, towards some as asymptote that turns out to be around 1. So there is a phase transition. And if you look at the nature of this phase transition, from the point of view of the intensity of rotation overlap, you see a weak signal that it is not Gaussian anymore uh, beyond the transition point, even though the tails are rather small. And you can as well compute the standard overlap Parisi overlap on the left side. And you see, OK, you see clearly it's not Gaussian, but tails are more. Or you can also compute, I mean, the mm, offspring of the link overlap. So it's a quadruplet overlap, uh, if you like. And here, the signal, I mean, the thing that you have clearly two peaks uh, is, is, more, is more enhanced. So we have replica symmetry breaking of some kind. It should be one step, but OK. Uh, we are satisfied for now with that. And this is how spectra look like. The above is the average of the spectra at different pumping rates, that is different temperatures, average over different uh, coupling configurations. And, and below there is just one, one coupling configuration, okay, thermalized. And you see that, I mean, the behavior, apart from the fact that we, we neglect the leakages, it is quite similar to the one found in experiments. And the point at which, a point at which the, the spectrum is not homogeneous anymore the, is, OK, we, we see that we have breaking of equipartition. So in the, yellow, in, the yellow, in the yellow curve, you see there is, I mean, some almost constant spectrum. But if you go beyond the critical point, some modes, they take more energy. And some others take less. And those that take more energy take much more energy. So it's very spiky. So I want to uh, mm, describe this more quantitatively. And I can introduce an, a spectral entropy. In this case, it's just, I mean, the normalized, the, lo the, the entropy of the normalized intensity. And I can define an effective number of degrees of freedom that is the exponential of the spectral entropy. If I divide it by n, I expect something that is constant and equal to, to n, and equal to 1 if I have equipartition. And this is what happens in the, uh, if you like, in the hot phase or below pumping threshold. But at some point, this, this starts to go down and actually goes down increasingly with n. Okay? So, the point at which this breaking of equipartition occurs coincides with the point where I expect, uh, I mean, the, the infinite, uh, in infinite sides limit of the, of the phase transition, or the glassy phase transition. And this was not for granted. Uh, I mean, it's never been studied before just because no one did this kind of simulations with the, with the, with the spherical model. Okay? And spherical models are introduced as, a, as an, a tool to make exact computations. Okay, but in this case, they, they actually reproduce the, the real physics of the thing. And then, okay, just a last comment is about this power or intensity condensation. And, okay, I, I spare you the zoology, the complete zoology. Just look at this cage at the zoo, okay? We, this is our case. So I have a frustrated system. And my connectivity scales like n to the cube. Okay? If it scales like n, n squared, one quadruplet would take everything. And here, in the fully connected case, there would be no problem. In this case, I, I, I see that there is a strong equipartition breaking. So I want to study it a little bit more. And you see, this is the participation ratio in this case. You see, as, as before, that something happens around 1, and the partition ratio the participation ratio times n increases, increases very much with n below this point. And so, but yet I don't have power condensation. So I mean, it's, it's not that one quad, the four modes on a single quadruple, the largest, I mean, the, the, those linked to the largest coupling constant take everything. There is some kind of, I mean, semi-condensation. If you look at the, at the blue curve, or low pumping, you see that the distribution of the, of the intensity values 
of A squared, renormalized, you see that they have a high probability to be, I mean, small. Okay, one, two. If if instead I'm in the low, I'm in the high pumping region that is low T, I still have a finite probability of finding a number of modes that are small, but also I have a small probability here to have very large, very large uh, intensities. So this is actually what happens. So, so I, I don't have a, a complete condensation, but, but something like that. So many modes take a small fraction, but overall contribution to the to the, what it, to the total constraint is of order n. And then I have a few modes that take an order n, or square root of n, contributes. OK. And so with this, I'm, I'm over. So that's, that's the work so far. OK. And uh, so I hope I didn't tell you that statistical physics is very useful to reproduce and predict the behavior of light in random media because I don't think you are very much interested. But I, I, I told you what you can learn about, I mean, a possible measure of the P of Q in, with, with, on this kind of models, on this kind of models here. And well, I, I showed you uh, the state of the art of our, of our simulations, Monte Carlo simulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this must be a bit different. Yes. Yes. Does it have many states or just a few? No, it should. Uh, by many states, you mean increasing with n or increasing exponent? Yes. Increasing with n. Exponential with n. Uh, that I, I can't tell. I mean, it, that means it, it's even finite sites. So I would not expect them to be, to be stuck in some uh, in some metal stable minima. But I have to, I mean, that, that, that's what I have to, to prove looking at, at, the, at the simulations. Because I have no control on, on, the, on the story they do. Yeah, but you show a P of Q as if this is what you would see in as being class. That's not what you would see in as being class. Uh, first of all, it's not self averaging, so you wouldn't have a complete curve. For a single sample, you would get a few spikes, and that's all. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, that's one of the possible shapes I have. What, what do, you, do you say? I mean, for a single, yeah. That there is an analogy, but, but that's not what the spin glass would show you. What? Exactly. So, the thing is, I have no control on these deltas I have. I mean, I, they are quite so. Whether this this thing in between is some some noise or okay, I I cannot tell. You know? so that that that's simply the point. Also, there could be spikes. I mean, let's say it's exactly like you say. So you have one sample and it's not self average. I have several spikes, but those spikes are just beyond the noise. Are below the noise. I mean. That's something. I mean, I, I, throw, I try to think all of arguments possible. I think the only thing I want to do is, is to look at it uh, directly. I mean, it look. be a transition into something else. Not just, just on this point. What else? That's I mean, if you look to a simulation of a spin glasses, if you look to a single realization, is that what you get something like that? You get the image, Jorge showed is only if you do average over the couplings. Here you are not doing average. I mean, it's just equivalent to a single realization. You, you mean experiments? Yes. Just in a question. In the experiment, how many scatterers they have? How, and how, how, how many scatterers? Yes. yes. How many modes or how many scatterers? No, scatterers. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but uh, how do this, I mean, how the scatterers matters that I, I don't, I mean, I know that if scatterers are not enough, you actually don't have a random laser. I know if they are enough, you have standing modes established there, and I can, and I can actually measure this stuff, or 
Yeah, that, that. Yes, but more than 10. More than 10, exactly, more than 10. Maybe more than uh, 10,000. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Luca, did you observe any out of equilibrium dynamics aging, uh, both that, numerical that, and experimentally? Because we no, know that experimentally experiment we cannot see. I mean, these measurements, they last, uh, the, the acquisition time is one tenth of a millisecond. Okay, imagine that the typical time is a nanosecond. So, we, we, I mean, but, um, and I mean, at least I don't know any experimental is able to do that, but I, that, that's, that's not my field. And numerical, we, we, we didn't study yet. We wanted first to see whether, I mean, this, I mean, we had a lot of problems with power condensation. Even, even in the limit case, you see, we have this semi-condensation thing, so we, we were mu very much concentrated on, on, on studying and assessing the equilibrium. Um, you said if you had a liquid random laser, it would look very different. So uh, uh, what is important here is that you have somehow a, a fixed uh, random distribution of atoms or so, and then you have a, a fixed yeah. uh, number of modes, which, yes. which would be how many? Uh, I think this number of modes, that depends on the material. Here I think they are all the order of, uh, yes, that's another part. They are all the order of some hundred thousands, okay? The point is, that's another point, that the spectrum has a finite width, okay? So when I look at the intensity of a mode, I'm not, I mean, in the simulation, I'm not looking at the intensity of a mode in an experiment because all the modes with the frequencies is, is in uh, 0.3 nanometers, they are mixed together, okay? I have, I don't know, it depends on the resolution of the spectrum, but I can have, I don't know, 200 beans or 1,000 beans. I have no idea, but it's not 100,000. So. That, that's another thing. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not. So each each point for the intensity in the spectrum is does not always correspond to to a single mode. That depends on the material. Well, so we're willing to tolerate saying glassy, but we defend vigorously the honor of the spin glass. Anyway, it's. Uh, I'd like to thank the speaker again and start the next talk. <laughs>